Okay, so I think we'll get started. So I'm um, Scott Dalski and I am to organize the, the uh, seminar series and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abakal Kazi, Associate Professor in the Center of Psychiatry at Addis Ababa University, visiting the lecturer at King's College London, and a fellow of the Academy of Sciences. He attained the Ababa University, his graduate degree in psychiatry from the Royal College of Psychiatrists of London and Carter University. His PhD in pediatric epidemiology from the Mayan University in Sweden. He's on the epidemiology of severe psychiatric disorders regarding clinical interventions for such disorders, especially in Ethiopia. He's a child's unit in the College of Health Science at Addis Ababa University and the head of the Center for Innovative Drug Development and Therapeutic Trials for Africa, which is a World Bank and Regional Center for Excellence for Therapeutic Discovery. And we're thrilled to have to speak to us today about the depression conundrum in global mental health research. Um, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I should acknowledge Professor Vikram Patel, who is one of my mentors, real mentors. Uh, and in the thinking through what I'm going to present, we have been talking about this and thinking about this reflection on this. And he's part of a project supported by the New Caritas, by the New Caritas Council and the Street of the United Kingdom. Essentially, uh, develop interventions to improve the detection of depression. And, and um, a big time, but I think I sincerely believe that there is a big challenge around. Uh, understanding depression and taking what we know in depression into clinical practice. I also believe that if we address that, that could also be an opening for the broader uh, knowledge gap in, in mental health epidemiology as well as uh, understanding mental disorders more, uh, more broadly. Um, I have any conflicts in my current presentation. This is the slide to acknowledge who is supporting what we do in Ethiopia and internationally. Um, so what do I want through this presentation? It's part of um, a humble reflection with you, my thinking around uh, depression work, the critical steps should be, uh, the critical next steps should be in terms of translating what we know about depression into clinical uh, practice. How did this come about? So some years ago, um, uh, Professor Vikram Patel is a director of this uh, project called PRIME. And the method of PRIME project was to support <coughs> mental health care through integrated care in low and middle income countries. And there are five low and middle income countries as part of this uh, to other high income, higher education institutions, and so on. So. If you have the idea, it's a different part of the project. So, in the project, we didn't have much problem in scaling up care for psychosis. We had some, but knew how to do that. So, we planned to scale up care for 80% of people needing care for psychosis. Essentially, we managed to do that. And uh, of course, most people know what psychosis is. So the district where we work, the 180,000 people that are really impressed by what we are doing. We thought that like, for nearly percent of people with the clubs, we didn't have any problem doing that, so we scaled that. The disorders were completely successful. I'm really happy with that. When it came to, we had some confess we didn't think the problem was going to be big. And it ends up being quite, quite big. And the problem was, of course, protection of depression by primary care clinicians was extremely low. That story new, it's not a new story. It's a problem published about for over 30, 40 years. Uh, but much bigger in poorer countries like Britain, low income countries like Ethiopia. So infection rate was extremely low. So we provided a brief training. Um, the training would be improved the detection rate. What 
detection goes, the detection rate actually went down in this data. So the solo search started. So I, I, I determined to look at the broader literature <coughs> and you, you need to learn middle income countries. The detection depression was broadly cool. And that distance improve was brief uh, in the circle. And I drew the different trainings. The only promising study I looked at was a Malawi study uh, in psychological medicine in 2014. And that study, there's a clear improvement in the detection rate of depression. So, pre is zero. Post training, the detection rate goes up to 9%. The numbers go up substantially. Um, you know what is different because that particular model was used in Kenya, and in Kenya the, the impact was quite limited. Um, the issue for me wasn't just you know we are struggling to actually treat uh, depression. The issue was uh, big that I was worried that this may impact the broader initiative on um, scale care more broadly because many low income countries. Like, like, like Ethiopia, there is a huge initiative to dial up mental health care and services. Uh, the um, government, the funders are also interested. And in the rain, why, why this was, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, my, and, and, and within the care program, we, we provide patients with depression stand to benefit because they prefer to be. Treated as primary care, number one. Number two, the depression method is put it in primary care settings. It is the number one disorder, psychiatric disorder. Some, in some places, anxiety tops. In many places, the depression is treated. So many, many people put depression in primary care and they like to be treated in primary care. If it's depression, it's essentially the scale up. Is very small, and the important cannot be utilized, and that could have uh, a vicious circle. So, that, so I, I that we need we need to actually address uh, this uh, problem. Good. So, of course, you use why do we have this this, this uh, problem? And I'll take you through. My reflection, uh, my reflection as well as what the literature says uh, in, 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 in this regard. So, of course, it is one of the oldest disorders in society. And in fact, it's the only uh, category from the old, old uh, mental disorders described. And in the story, anyway, it's uh, uh, described <laughs> by. Um, I think Hippocrates and Melancholia, one of the four uh, conditions. And, and um, although we confuse what he meant by Melancholia, uh, which is a kind of long way now, uh, when it started. But people were not very happy because of its ideological overtone. Particularly, Emil Krepley wasn't happy, you know, Emil Krepley was. Depression was being used uh, from the 14th century, and it, it came into Italy. This French artist was credited for that. Started to mention as a clinical psychologist. Then he liked it, so he's written the term manic depressive insanity or manic depressive illness. They became, became part of the nomenclature uh, after that. Um, Essentially, the, the more use of the term depression is just over 100 uh, years. Um, and then we know what happens um, those who are student psychiatric uh, disorder classification. The term depression, although not used as explicitly in the final criteria, it was referred to uh, depression explicitly referred to. We also might present 
there are difficulties in the some major discussions. Um, and then more questions. And uh, I think I can use my Pfizer specifically why they used decide to use a family that is the daughter. And he says that certain sound is like general enough. Yeah. So something general enough. <coughs> that is not the major for dancing. We know the underlying part of physiology of depression. And it is expressive. Sort of just that part of that. But, but some really get upset. So this is post us Stephanie's uh, some of you might know this. You can't listen to the tone of this is in writing. You actually can't listen. So actually talking about depression here, I just wrote this on Google. But just this is like this is like this. So he's not happy at all that term depression is being used. Um so I'm not satisfied. But as I said, I d I don't think that that's the major problem. But the major problem is that there is a little progress in defining what depression is, what constitutes depression, and not easy to conceptualize such an art. How not be easy? If you look at the pain of the death, for example, and you look at the SM5, they are almost identical, except few, like uh, John Ferrer, a one month uh, duration uh, in the it's two weeks or, or things, but this is not in the course in time. Uh, and just then puts it as a course. So those kind of peripheral fibers, they're <coughs> fundamental difference. The second uh, issue there is, you know what happens around the SM before the SM was placed. The SM number was a reliability of psychiatric diagnosis and there was a question of instrument particularly after the SM. So, yes, of course, I don't know the result. After um, the SM, there was a proliferation of psychiatric instruments like, like the DI. In fact, the DIS was preceded by the present state examination, refers to the DIS and other instruments. So, <coughs> but because those instruments were linked to the diagnostic criteria, it has pointed to in a way. So what you get from the diagnostic criteria is what you get in the instrument and vice versa. And we have not been thinking uh, out of box too much. And that, of course, gave, gave us the criticism that depression is not actually a uh, absolute disorder. And thanks to Western depression and so on, which uh, I'm not entirely confident <coughs> that's the case, but Depression now is a common common, common word. Every understand or not understand it, but every person But the truth is, this was really surprised. Even doctors, psychiatrists, when they are depressed, they don't really understand them. I was working when I was training at Montclair, I was working in a clinic uh, at the National Association. And doctors know mainly go to the clinic. Um, they find they have depression. So depression is an easy thing to understand. You need to validate it with the other people and then so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, but people think they know, and it splits opinion of people. So if that's <coughs> the what the Daily Mail reporter says, it's, uh, for her, it is a uh, misery movement and it's a survey everybody should have. So it's a fashion thing. And uh, I think post uh, reader says something really different. Uh, this is an accessory I'm really suffering. It's uh, the, the split you could see. And this uh, family helps to get uh, the big movement. A very helpful movement in my view. Actually a cultural artifact. So if in many low-income countries, if you say depression, they have no clue. So I'm to coin a term, portion. And it's um, easy to coin a new term for something like depression. We try, look, 
listening to quality team interviews were building. And the enterprise has to push the concept of depression. And the, the patient has no clue what the interview is talking about. So you, you could challenge. Um, so it's, it's a large factor. Not having the terminology doesn't make it a cultural aspect. Of course, language is a major part of culture. But not having that term doesn't make something not part of culture. Maybe you uh, recognize. But if you pass the how, how, how it's cast, and there is more pressure with happiness uh, now in the Western culture. Nobody, you know, wants to be happy or sad. But perhaps there is much more preoccupation with happiness in Europe countries. So that you know what that there is for that. So happiness is also a preoccupation of the doctors. So if you look back, Russell and others have this preoccupation. The Greeks have preoccupation with with happiness. Then the Enlightenment movement and uh, the okay. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll try to speak yeah. so uh, for me uh, looks like it is entitlement uh, people have the material things and, and so on and so forth so the idea of happiness lo looking at the background it was to do with virtue and justice. So that's really where the happiness idea was from. Of course, they, well, back then, there was a lot of problems, there were lots of problems and conflicts and so on. People were preoccupied with those values and virtues. And I think that has changed. That, that idea, um, even when the professor of the Enlightenment philosophers and so on described how that's really the idea. So. Reading superficially, that's where actual architect comes from because many people took the depression construct or concept think happiness is the entitlement of the West. Uh, happiness is not really in the law in middle income countries in the history from Greek and Europe and so on. But depression was a concept even during the Egyptian time. So so essence sadness are constructs and concepts in every in my view anyway. But in the terminology itself is definitely of European origin. In fact it is of a Greek origin, Jules Angus speaks explicitly. Um, but I think and then issues to do with uh, the initial observation of uh, depression and the version was viewed people like Freud didn't think depression would be a problem in a country like Africa. Um, so that, that links to this view that depression actually may be um, a cultural aspect. But despite the say and the answer can my describe, we know of a lot about depression. That we don't understand. That is a portion of what we know about depression. But there are core things I believe we know about depression. Um, just to make it explicit for you, it's too difficult to identify why depression is important because we have got lots of data. The, for example, the ICD DSM or whatever criteria, we have a burden of depression is very high. It's common, it's disabling, it's associated with mortality and what have you. If you are like a public health case, of course, something has to be treatable. We know depression, there are options of treating depression. But there should be a high treatment gap to make public health cases, and there is a high gap, especially in low middle income countries. So we know less than 10 people with major depressive disorder receive uh, treatment. So it's not too difficult to make um, more than that. And of course, I also like, like clinical stories. Um, and these clinical stories would tell you that this core of what we call it makes a lot of sense across culture. 
but it also is very consequential. So this first uh, lady was a strong lady. So she came to the hospital. I wasn't actually involved in her care, but I was involved in the health discussion later. So multiple losses, but she was okay. Well, not okay, but she uh, the losses and was very strong. Lost her husband was very strong. Lost her father was very strong. And there were many things. So she made <coughs> in this main work of supporting her children with this method. At last, though, she died. She was very close to her aunt. So when her that was it. So she gave up. And she went to places before she came to the, the psychiatric hospital. But at the time she arrived at the psychiatric hospital, and she was completely cut off. And some sort of neurological, so they did scan, as you could see, it's a scan, and you see uh, a small mass, right? Frontal mass. It's a many. Then the scientist thought this must be uh, the reason that this lady is cut off. So they sent her to the neurosurgeon. There was no place. Unfortunately, in the process, this lady died. So what happened was, after she lost her aunt, completely preoccupied by everything, she discovered all the classic symptoms of what one was So this lady had. DCT, I'm almost sure she wouldn't have died. So this is another interesting story of how culture and uh, depression may have. Last story, the maybe more interest where you could see how depression and culture overlap more, more substantially. So I look towards my and uh, this first lady again. Uh, shows a very <coughs> confident, shows up for the whole department. I read for the last, you know, she had no problem at all. Uh, she had a 16 year old and I think a 10 year old uh, children. She had from her band some six, ten years previously. Uh, wasn't an apparent issue. Today she had a dream, she says, in which she saw herself being involved in an accident and she died. So that's what she She wakes up and reflects her, um, her brother had also died. Of them, he had a dream, a very similar dream, but and he died from a car accident. So she was completely preoccupied by this dream. She has children, she's going to die. Then, soon what happened was she started to lose her appetite. She was waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning, thinking about her, that, she's, that she's guilty, she wasn't good enough for her kids. She started to losing her weight. The thing was, she lost confidence. I think that's one of the crucial things. She felt worthless. She lost confidence. She wasn't confident enough to go and speak to her. Uh, the director. She was so anxious. Um, and she started to be slow in her activities. Um, she wasn't able to deliver on time on things she had to deliver. The decision was because she was sinful and she was going she was, she was going to die, she had decided to go and live in a monastery. <coughs> so when I saw her I remember it was um, <coughs> Dark evening with a bit of light on the side, and I see her tears flowing down. For me, she was depressed. For her, she was going to die. And she had her children and so on and live in a monastery. So we agreed in the middle. So I said, Why don't you try it, uh, doctor, and see what happens? And that's what she did. So uh, over 10 years now, she takes her treatment, she continues to work, she's doing fine. But she also became a bit more religious. So she goes to the to church and things like that. So 
this is not just you know somebody having depression as such. But this could have had a catastrophic consequence on this day. She was going to abandon her own work, abandon her children, and live somewhere else. Yeah. Have a, so depression. These are just uh, subjective examples. Um, it's a, something with gene that affects people quite, quite drastically. So, uh, went to a private clinic. She was given antidepressant medication. That aside. <coughs> Given us some supportive people, of course. Yeah, but uh, well, it's clear poverty and depression are quite intertwined. So, most of you know the work of uh, Professor Esther Duflo at Hosford. Uh, how helplessness and depression keeps people in for a bind of poverty. Like a story from the past, I wasn't able to find it this time. Anyway, from two years ago or so. Uh, there was an African American lady who was uh, a difficult childhood and eventually became depressed in homebound. She now she was depressed. Uh, but from community outreach program from the University Hospital, uh, the story is from NYC. In, in the program, they had a, a CBT program. Actually. So, so her shown bound, I mean, the story, I don't want to make the story too long, but she was homebound, she was hopeless, she was doing nothing. And all the classic symptoms of depression that we had in this room. And she house and joined the rest of the group. So, but what did was they, I don't remember this whether they, she had to go anyway, or they gave her a few treatments. Anyway, eventually she's a CVT group. She improved, she improved. She got a business relationship, she got employed, she got out of the poverty trap. Uh, is that interesting? So I think depression and poverty are quite intertwined. Uh, and one could remember back and any, any, think about people who are poor and so on, and you could imagine that have had an impact. <laughs> so, depression is extremely important issue. And I take you through the data we have from Ethiopia um, the impression and, and, uh, and click has the hallmarks of uh, public health importance. So, it's one of the leading causes of. Uh, this is built and a little bit old. Um, I don't have any recent studies. It's in the it's the sixth uh, above each other. And this number of slides I'm using now are showing you the disability, sort impairment uh, uh, that you would see. So the sub social limitation in people with depression, but also limitation. So in every physical activities. But also interests me is here, they become less careful in what they do when they are depressed. And they will have persistent limitation, not just limitation, but the limits persistent. And then the other thing we look for is how does the carer feel? So in low income countries, carer feel is very important. Carer must feel burdened by depression. Is something Kind of palpable as this depression, yeah. Uh, and mortality. So you could see uh, years of life, people with major depressive disorder is just not shot. Uh point so uh previous slide is that Ethiopia? Yeah, this is all data from it. So we haven't published it. But, yeah. Uh, and mortality also. Uh, but this one is more interesting for me. Um, this is done an extended cost effectiveness analysis. So, what you see uh, here is the uh, infantile, the 
one is a porous, Q5 is a HS. What you see is treating the patient is probably yeah, so, uh, more than storage. This is a small coverage, 30% coverage. So, give them understanding why treating the plus is cost effective and useful. But, percent coverage is a 30% coverage that is similar. So, for me, it's an important concept and concept. There are issues we need to deal with. Uh, sorry about this. One of the main issues um, I, I want to raise now. For me, there is translational, and then there are calls from, from them. Uh, so, Some of the examples I could give you, which are clear way for you. Uh, biological data is quite inconsistent, even the same within the same country, within the same place, by different group, same group, inconsistent. It's made in the same way, in different ways. Um, pushing, as I mentioned, is very important. Part of the issue for me is that, that the point in uh, psychic. Uh, hospitals and clinic, what we're at is depression in a primary care setting. Is the country hospital can capture depression in a primary care setting uh, is an important issue, uh, I think. So, in terms of epidemiological con consistency, I think it's very clear everybody talks about it. It's a huge um, difference uh, in multiple studies. So, this is the uh, Part of the world mental survey, you could see, you know, nearly 10 points between the study. Um, so, uh, this is uh, a book from Professor Martin Hill's uh, group. Uh, you could you, you think among uh, people. Yes. This is on CD. Okay. Yeah. And in, in general population? This is in general population. In many countries. That's a mental health survey. Uh, one, ones, some of them are using scenarios um, and some of them are using diagnostic scales. But you see a huge difference. This is from Africa. You, this is just for you have the, the feel of it. Uh, not in the details, uh, but you could see. I find this quite interesting. This is an analysis. No many instruments we use uh, in mental health. So, and, and all of you know this, ideas and ideas are similar thing. Uh, these are the main instruments we use. And the only thing this instrument is very Sorry. And what that means is, although we have compared studies using different instruments, actually we are comparing studies that are not comparable. This is um, something uh, interesting. Um, there are Public, public health issues we need to address, but at the same time, I think we need to look at the construct of depression in more depth. Um, has not been given huge attention thinking about the construct of depression. Uh, um, that's one of the, 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 the problems. And the other problem, depression research, I think my, my reflection would be there are things studies that require reputation. So an example, fantastic study from the Hopkins group in Uganda. 96% of this was depression improved with group uh, CV, IP. That's phenomenal. But um, that kind of special application uh, before it becomes standard. Some solutions 
are pragmatic and important. Uh, they require more intensive and rigorous work. For example, screening may be, for discussing with Professor Van uh, it may be an important way forward. Uh, sorry, the data is perfect. Uh, the current training tools require a lot of training. And that is a small, small job. Uh, so, in my, 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 my reflection, uh, reason for optimism uh, from all, because there are many things we know. But in low and middle income countries, sorry, this is a crowded uh, thing. Um, but in many low and middle income countries, the only way to scale up services is through task shifting. Primarily, although there is gaps in knowledge, they are interested, happy to, to be taught and knowledge and to provide care and service. Uh, for me, it is, is, is important uh, not. But to say previously, I think we should rethink the construct of depression. And I don't have, you know, um, right on how that should be done. But I think we may need to think out of the box or means of what they call first um, It's not easy to do because we have got a construct sitting in front of us and blocking the way. Uh, so think some ways of doing that. But there are obvious things that could be done. For example, think about depression construct, the bipolar depression and unipolar depression. That's different conditions. Yeah. But we use them diagnostic criteria. We diagnostic criteria for community services, for primary, for psychiatric services. This is what they are. I think the small thing is one could do. And there is this interesting work uh, <coughs> published recently looking at depression in men trying to use different. Symptoms that may be more relevant to men. And the prevalence of depression between men and women was, was, was compared. Can we think differently about different groups, how the symptoms are manifested? That's another thing that may be of, of, of uh, Improving detection is crucial, but improving detection requires a broad range of work. In, in principle, we know. Where should we go in the middle income country? And we've got some idea uh, on how to do it. But uh, in detection in a comprehensive way, as all the barriers are across the range. Um, so that's very important. The other issue in low middle income countries is changing the system uh, as it in. In, in the income countries. I think that will take some time. Um, I don't know if this region, but I find the Malawi study interesting um, and shared me the, uh, the actual training packages. So the rest of that training was quite drastic. Uh, so, so potentially there may be some some effective ways of training primary healthcare workers um, that we could we could look uh, onto. Uh, that's an issue. And alternative models of depression. I think the men women model is one thing I talked about, but there is this thing minor depressive disorder um, within the same construct. But what I find interesting. Interesting, as mentioned in the qualitative study, these do not talk about their emotions so much. So we may identify certain symptoms that give us the um, uh, I, I agree with them. Going so and, and energy is, is example, uh, okay. but there may be some core telling symptoms that people say if they are saying sweet. Uh, the concept of minor depressive disorder may be meaningful. Um, I'm interested in the idea uh, of understanding it enough, uh, but that might be also one 
interesting part of the box idea. Yeah. That could be uh, for sure. Um, and and we, we might be able to get some uh, with that. So, sorry. That's the criteria. That's the I sharing. When Tosser was the director of an IMH, that was what. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so it gives different uh, uh, physiologists or clinical descriptors to uh, to the validity of uh, psychiatric syndromes arising from clinical descriptors. We use a broader construct that the other should. Why do we just focus on depression regulatory syndrome? Could we use it could might it be more sensible, particularly in some settings, to have a, a, a broader product like a common mental disorder construct uh, so on, which may be amenable to some specific interventions. <coughs> I have balance here. I'm not really very confident about the question of covalence. Uh, and then the opportunity. So we focus on the facility. So when we talk about scale, scale up, we focus on the care provider, food burden. And this is um, the work of departments, I believe, fighting the village at the time. I, I like it. Uh, our model that, that, that works. Uh, that model I mentioned previously. But this has to be carefully done. But I think this may be also one thing one has to think to tackle depression. Just about the construct of depression for the state, there's a piece first and try to address it. But that, of course, requires interim that works for a condition that's a problem, so that's an issue. And that's also, you know, you don't want to medicalize as a, say, a social problem. So can you integrate the approach with integrated uh, intervention approach. Uh, so that's uh, another obvious thing one could think of. Uh, so these are my say my uh, uh, reflex uh, um, of vast domain of data and literature. Um, for your attention, um, for the three people I would like to acknowledge. Thank you. I think one of the issues that I'm sure you know Ajapan would be very interested to hear from you about is that given your experience both as a biomedically trained psychiatrist and by that we really refer to a patient that is quite universal, no matter whether you're from Ethiopia, India or the US we get exactly the same frame of reference uh, thanks to our training. Uh, but that you worked for pretty much all your clinical career in Ethiopia. Uh, is working in a rural primary care setting, to what do you think the biomedical construction of the diagnosis depression is something you utilize in your clinical encounter? Either, for example, communicate to your, your patient or to derive some kind of therapeutic uh, benefit. I, I think um, not sitting on the biomedical model as a clinician requires a degree of maturity. I've worked at rural district hospital um, for the state depression, that much, and so on. I always had the most time a repeated complaints in the group at times regular depression. So we always communicate, um, and the thing is, what I said <coughs> is, is patients almost never wanted to hear or discuss us about their problems. You are the doctor, you know. You say, I have flu, I have got the flu. I have got malaria, I have got malaria. Um, so I, I think that's how they understand it. So the, 
competition source they're thinking of when they talk to you, they think of a more violent type of stuff. That's what we get to do a lot of our use from. That's not all of them now. Not all time poetry things, not all covers. We don't get into that in Lama Pesha. That's just what I'm talking about. I've been tempted to do the work and the study. I'm just. You know, very puzzled by the fact that I think, for me, in my the gap isn't so much between cultures; it's more a gap between the specialist way of conceptualizing human mental distress and the way most other people do. And I, I find that, you know, that the issues of pinning and the low apparent low protection of primary care are not just true in developing countries. In fact, they're also true in Asian countries, uh, and even here in the U.S. Uh, the fact that screening is being recommended by the U.S. Task Force is a strategy to address the low detection rates in primary care here. So the culture wouldn't apply in the same way as we are discussing it right now, because if this was a cultural issue, then you expect that actually people's culture who are physicians and their patients should have a far greater degree of uh, uh, conversation about something they can all agree on, and actually that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I, I am increasingly, I think that the very biomedical categorical model of human experience associated with stress, whether it's anxiety, depression, or trauma, these I would say are the three broad ones, um, are, don't travel very well from the specialist clinic to primary care and the community, and this is more a universal phenomenon rather than a cross-cultural one. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and certainly, you know, I've worked in primary care in Britain as well. And GP is exactly the same thing. They will tell you, you know, this thing we call depression. You know, we see lots of people with sleep problems and tiredness and fatigue, and they have social suffering, basically. You know, that they have difficult lives. And so they don't want to be diagnosed with depression because that's a whole lot of other uh, implications and meanings attached to that people can want. The last 20 years, there's been a more sort of marketing around categories like, like depression and other categories. Is there any type of marketing of depression itself that in Ethiopia? Uh, that's an interesting question. No. There, there, there is no uh, marketing of different. We're trying to market depression. Yeah. <laughs> There's a pharmaceutical company. Um, <coughs> of, of course, the, the, the dilemma is you categories. Um, to, to make meaning for the patient and also to give them time. So work with the patient anyway. What, what, in some things, some patients require, want you to explain like, why they are ill. Uh, the patient explains it to them. Nice. And it gets that kind of depression. And the who do not want any depression ever be because for them, anxiety, whatever it is, is an indication of weakness or it's a psychosis. Uh, once again, it is an human stress. Uh, I'm asking a question for both of you. But, um, in this idea that the depression is maybe a part of a kind of growing hunger or stress or stress, does that have obvious implications for the kids? And so, for what is what does the primary doctor or or practitioner from that region or or care of the care clinicians have complicated uh, uh, an illness sometimes. So if I just give you an example. So we trained this guy in the prime side and there was a who had depression. But this lady had complicated problems. They got a problem. Uh, so there was clinicians that didn't treat her depression, but that actually worked. We had an advisory board, which also involved the police and the court and so on. So the role of the court, uh, the police, partially, 
they go home educated. So um, they do on, on this front. Uh, in fact, my feeling is they over is a social part than the that. So if there's an issue or conflict, someone is really depressed and there is a conflict, or a country is depressed, but this is her life. And so so they ignore the depression and focus on the social part. And sometimes what I see in, in the private care setting when they do the social. It's a really interesting question you know, because I, I, first of all, there are two different points I want to just briefly make. The first is about social suffering. Um, ironic, uh, if we accept that social factors cause mental health problems, depression, in this instance, the fact that are more likely to suffer in fact is in the poor. It must be therefore quite understandable why the burden of depression is more common in the poor. However, when you go to a primary care practitioner, the practitioner is more likely to see a problem as your policy rather than your mental health. So it's in the double jeopardy that actually you are denied a possibility of a mental health intervention because you are poor. And it seems also the only people who can be depressed are those who are rich because they don't have any other reason to be miserable. Uh, and you know, it, it's a very peculiar sort of mindset that a lot of primary care physicians will carry. But it's not completely, um, you know, we shouldn't dismiss it. It is true that just simply treating someone with sympathy or a pill when their husband is violent, isn't going to take away the primary problem in their life. So some kind of mixed model of care in the social work practice to integrate with primary care would I be the key, you know, the key lesson on how you deal with mental health problems in the context of social suffering. And the second point you asked was really about them actually talking about a dimension uh, and adopting a binary model that works very well as, for example, in your area, in sex diseases, you can you divide the world into people with and without HIV, but you can't divide the world into people with and without depression. That is a completely arbitrary division. And I think what the field is moving towards is more of a chronic disease model, which is a stage model. So take diabetes um, uh, analogy, you can have more of stage one kind of diabetes where the interventions are largely self-care, behavior change, encourage supportive self-care. Stage two might be a pill, stage three might be insulin. It's that people up the severity scale, uh, you more costly, more resource intensive and then interventions apply. But a lot of the focus is on low intensity interventions that are time and also promote self advocacy. So that it's not just a, a rationalizing clinical model for everyone. I think that's the way all fields in psychiatry is moving, is to a stage uh, understanding of mental illness. Tough question, in a way. 
because uh, I, I think two things to to say. Uh, I think part of the reason there is like research capacity in this country. So um, studies have been journal driven or driven by people um, research on high uh, To make that replicated or sustainable, there should have interest locally and capacity locally high for So it was basically we have been saying this for a very long time. Um, uh, and the nice colleagues of ours are, are running individual IPCs now, um, but we are not developing the evidence because uh, our colleagues, there is enough evidence to say, you know, you can give IPCs because that has been established in some places. So uh, uh, local capacity has to be tried. Um, it, 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 it has to be strategic in a, in a way also. I, I, um, I think, like WHO collaborative centers may be useful model in some respects. So you have few places, at least in Africa, you can't have many places at this stage, at least few places that that, uh, collaborated that one could invest on and they develop um, so evidence for intervention of this nature. Uh, their, their work would be just that. So, uh, like in collaborative centers, uh, that sort of thing. And places of that, that nature. So, as done intentionally, uh, the data change every time and we are moving all the time. Uh, that, that's uh, might need uh, some, some help from other places, but I, I, I think I mean the Huda, for example, I was just showing um, you can uh, different diseases, don't, but it is definitely biomedical. Um, and and to, uh, yeah. the, the, for example, the capability model that. Can be for functioning in the, the, the assessment type. Um, and kind of thing is required a lot of adaptation to, to do. This disability assessment skills are not satisfactory at all. Uh, you have a data instrument as yet. Uh, and, and as I said, the public model is interesting, but needs of adaptation work. You know, it's quite. Uh, um, more than more than the Huda, uh, which is a bit for cross cultural application. Uh, having said that, I mean, what, one one challenge I should, should mention here for our commission: what, what problems do we have when we do research in the countries is actually bringing somebody on board who has more the social perspective, particularly. Uh, the critical psychiatry uh, perspective. So, um, because we, we had a, a debate in London, and uh, the famous uh, person, Derek Sanders, is beating whatever globalization is. Um, so, I, I tell the time, okay, come, let's work together. It's an important question, and I believe that it's really important. Come and let's work. 
which is the first person so what let's do first answer together that we need if people have questions we can for answer together um, so the, the, I, I, I think that you know even helps a lot and I'm not that to finish question uh, in my head I want to say before I finish <coughs> so, so I think if you have reflections thoughts or, or uh, you know, out of the box thinking let's read together uh, there are plus we can we can talk Yeah, I, I'm breaking the cycle of hopelessness is a crucial part of the cycle of hopelessness. I think and that's very close by Jekyll's work. But that work was economic work, mental health work. But they had access to the mental health component of it. So that, uh, the example I gave, for example, is just one example. The, the New York Times example is working with uh, mental illness, with the depression. And, and in that cartilage. So that I think it's really important to break the uh, that's an equal priority.